the big story. Hello, Jennifer. Rollinsville's still waiting. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Beckwith. There's your office. Night desk, Beckwith. Hiya, Bernie. Where you at? Rollinsville, back on the hills. Listen, in the middle drawer of the desk, you'll find an envelope marked hold. Yeah? Yeah, got it? Good. Open it, read it. The story I've been working up on my own time. What the heck? Listen, there are only two phone lines into Denver in this town. One is being held open for the police. The other I'm holding starting right now. If this comes through, it'll be exclusive. I'll start reading that story. I'll hang on here. Any questions as you go, ask me. Okay, okay. But what are you waiting for up there? The end of the story. If it comes, it'll be murder. <laughs> Denver, Colorado. From the pages of the Denver Post, the story of a reporter who sewed up a telephone line to lock up a killer. Denver, Colorado. The story as it actually happened. Bernard Beck with the story as he lived it. This one, you, Bernie Beckwith, reporter for the Denver Post, have been piecing together on your own time. And now, it's ready to pop. You're holed up in the one long telephone exchange of Rollinsville, waiting. You've sewed up the only remaining trunk line into Denver, just in case the opposition gets wind of the story and tries by phone to cash in on your work. But the operator's got something to say about that. Mr. Beckwith, I can't hold a line open for you unless you actually use it. But he's got the whole story in the office, operator. I I'm just waiting till the police come back. I'm sorry, I just can't hold a line all open right, for you. All right, all right, all right, I'll talk. Uh, what's that book there? The dictionary. Okay, let me have it. <laughs> Keep this line busy, all right. Here goes. It isn't much of a story, but... A, the first letter of the English alphabet and one of its five vowels. One, any, same, some particular kind of, as a song. Yes, you'll keep it up all night if necessary to keep this line open. It wasn't much of a story when you started. Just a little notice on the official police bulletin. Missing persons, Betty Gray, female, Rollinsville, Colorado. Age 24, 5 foot 1, 126 pounds, medium bill, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, Sarge, uh, got anything on this Betty Gray? No, nah, husband reported a missing routine, Bernie. Oh, say, if she lives in Rollinsville, how is it her husband didn't report it to the sheriff up there instead of down here in Denver? Mm, beats me. Why don't you go ask him yourself? <laughs> it's not worth the trouble. But uh, give me his name anyway. Paul. Paul Gray. He's a carpenter. Paul Gray. Okay, Sarge, thanks. So long. By coincidence, a week or so later, you run to the sheriff of the Rollinsville area, down in town on a case. Not meaning much, not expecting much. You ask him, Paul Gray's wife turn up yet? Betty? Mm -hmm. What do you mean, turn up? Isn't she still in Chicago? Chicago? She's supposed to be in Chicago? For well, sure, visiting her sister. Who says so? Oh. You know him? Sure, all my life. Oh. Okay, skip it. Chicago, huh? Just tell me this one thing, Mr. Gray. Why didn't you tell your friend, the sheriff, your wife was missing? Why did you spread that story about her going to Chicago to visit her sister? Well, you know how it is. A man doesn't like to go advertising to his friends around his own hometown that his wife's run out on him. Yeah, that's natural. Uh, just one little thing more, Mr. Gray. What was your wife wearing when you saw her last? Well, I was never one much for noticing women's clothes, but sort of a blue coat, blue shoes, pocketbook is black. Hat? Yes, sir, she... It is a feather hat. Bought it on our honeymoon. 
That is only five months ago, you know. Yeah. Five months married. No. Yeah, the last thing I saw as the train pulled out of the Denver Union Station was that little feather hat. What train was that? Put her on the 410 for Chicago. Beautiful train, big brand new Zephyr. California Zephyr, they call it. Got one of them swanky new cars with the domes on the roof. Oh, yeah, yeah, the uh, Vista Dome. That's it, Vista Domes. <laughs> last I saw her. Well, maybe she'll have a change of heart and come back to me. I don't know. I can always hope, huh? Well, it's a perfectly open story. That is, in the newspaper police sense, no story. But one day, about a few weeks after that, one of the men on the staff comes in from a lecture in Chicago. Ah, nice trip, Bernie. Better than driving any day. What'd you take, Larry? The Zephyr? Yeah. It was the first time I'd ever been in one of those Vista domes. Of course, it was mostly a night ride, but you can still uh, see some... A night ride? Yeah. When does she leave Denver? Zephyr? Mm-hmm. 7 p.m. Uh, you know trains, Larry. Does the 4 o'clock for Chicago have a Vista dome? Or does the 4 o'clock Zephyr the have... 4 o'clock Zephyr? Yeah. No such animal. There's only one California Zephyr through Denver, and that's at 7 p.m. And it's the only train passing through here with the Vista dome. Now it begins to look like a story. But not for the paper yet. Not till the police take over. So you point out the discrepancies in Gray's story to the Denver detective. The lieutenant says... Ah, uh, Bernie, you're being too suspicious. But just then, somebody turns up with a valise that was left in a locker at the Denver station around about the time Betty Gray first disappeared. The lieutenant opens it. <laughs> Woman's clothes. Any name on the valise? No. No way of finding out who left it. In the old days when they issued checks, it was easier. But now with these ten cent a day keys, I... Hey, wait. Laundry marks? No, no, initials. Sewed on a blouse. Oh, monogram, huh? Hey, it looks like E-R. Yeah, E-R. Betty Gray. Betty Gray E-R. Uh, no. Just the same. I think it wouldn't hurt to call Gray in for questioning. Okay. Will do. They do. And Gray reels off the same story. She ran out on him. He chased her into Denver. Found her in a motor camp. Argued with her. Finally figured it was best to give her her own head and let her go away for a while. Put her on the train. Haven't seen her since. You heard from her? No. Any idea where she might be? Well, her sisters. Chicago, that is. You have a right and try to find out? Well, I... No. But why not? You know, I figure if I made out I didn't care too much, didn't write, she might kind of miss me, you know? Uh, Mr. Gray. Yes, Mr. Beckwith. Do you recognize these clothes? No, sir. They don't belong to your wife? Betty, no, sir. Where'd they come from? Well, since they're not hers, it doesn't matter. But about this sister in Chicago, would you mind if we communicated with her? Well, not at all. Betty sent a telegram from the station. Might have been to her. Yeah, probably. And this would clear up the whole thing. Uh, what's her sister's name? Ridgeway. Martha Ridgeway. And your wife's maiden name was Elizabeth Ridgeway. Not Betty, but Elizabeth. E.R. Okay, you take over, Lieutenant. It's yours from here on out. The clothes were his wife's, all right. That he finally admits. And so, you finally have a story. Carpenter held in connection with wife's disappearance. Not held for, just held in connection with. Nothing really to go on, but the fact that she's gone. The fact that she's gone without her suitcase of clothes. And one other thing, an answer to a checkout in Chicago. Martha Ridgway, report, no word from Sister Elizabeth since January 1st, 1950. And Gray says he put her on the train March 6th. And it's now May 10th. But that isn't all he says. He blurts out the rest of the pathetic details of his marriage 
to you and the lieutenant. Well, from the first, it didn't work out so good. I had 21 years on her, you see. You know, a young woman living in a little town like Rollinsville, not much to do. I must stay at home. She was more the get up and go out type. So we had our. So when she run out on me, I give her a head a while, then tried to persuade her to come back. But she liked it and did. town for a while, gave her some money, and begged her at least to write to me. Let me know how she's getting along. It is the least she could have done. And did she, sir, write to you? Yes, sir, she did. A lot, too. She wasn't a mean girl, you know. She wanted me to understand her. Do you have those letters? Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Every last one. And where are they? Up in my cabin, hid away. But I'd hate for them to come out. I mean, there's things in them. That... What kind of things? Private things, Mr. Beck, was in a man's own private letters from his own wife. Mr. Gray, speaking of the law officer, it's only fair to tell you that this... This has gone a little beyond the missing persons case. And for your own protection, I think you'd better let us see those letters. Especially if they back up your story that your wife has left you. Just left you. The fact is, Mr. Gray, it begins to look like murder. <laughs> He agrees to lead you and the law to the letters. You go along with the police to his cabin in the back hills of Rollinsville. All right, now just where are those letters, Mr. Gray? Why, oh, I, I believe I got them in a mason jar in the pantry here. Nope, not here. Uh, right, come on, Mr. Gray, where are they? Or aren't there any letters at all? Well, I got them, Lieutenant, I got them, but I just... I can't remember where exactly they... Well, they might be in this chest. Uh, or in this here little table. I keep things in this drawer. Gray, put that down. Don't be a fool, Gray. Look out, buddy, look out! This is Cy Harris, returning it to your narrator and the big story of Bernard Beckwith, as he lived it and wrote it. You, Bernard Beckwith of the Denver Post, had worked up a story on your own time, a story for whose ending you are now waiting by an open telephone line. You'd started with a woman reported missing by her husband, managed to persuade the police to question him, and had gone with him and them to his cabin in Rollinsville. And there, he pulled a gun from hiding. Look out, buddy, look out! Look out yourself, he wasn't shooting at me. Grab that phone, get a doctor. The poor jerk's killed himself. No, not killed himself. Just creased his own head. Funny how they can miss at such close range. Now, he lies in a prison hospital while you and the law wait outside and second guess the whole deal. That's uh, all my fault, Bernie. <laughs> Should have guessed it had a gun hidden there. Oh, not necessarily, Lieutenant. We really had nothing solid on him. I, I got a weird idea it was a grandstand play. Mm -hmm. How's that? Well, if he really wanted to kill himself at that range, he couldn't have missed. No. No, I think he'll come to and ask to see you, then start spinning some yarn about... Oh, well, how's it going, Doctor? Fine, just a scratch. Now, can we see him? Can you? Why, the first coherent thing he said was, let me talk to the law. <laughs> Bernie, you're batting a thousand. Well, come on. Let's see what he comes up with this time, huh? The minute this reporter come asking questions, I knew it was just a matter of time before I'd get caught. So I, I want to tell the truth. Everything else was lies. This is how it really happened. After so much fighting and squabbling those first five months was married, I finally agreed it is best for us to break up. We got in the car, and I agreed to drive her as far as the hotel in Denver. But instead, I kept on going, 
saw. Paul, you keep passing motor camps. Aren't you going to stop? Not for a while, Betty, not for a while. Oh, but you promised. I know, I know. Honest, I'll stop, believe me. Every time you say that, I start not believing you. I wouldn't be in this mess if it hadn't been for you, if I hadn't have believed you. You and your lies about Denver being a hot little town. Well, no. And all the time it was Rollinsville you lived in. Yeah. And your big contract oh, in business. Honey, and I... all the time you were just a little old carpenter. And you're large in the mouth. Oh, baby, it's And all night. the time it was that crummy old shack. Believe me, dear, believe, I could... Believe me. Believe me. I wouldn't believe you if you said it was snowing and I was standing in the middle of a blizzard. Now, when are you going to stop and let me off? Colorado Springs, honey. Colorado Springs. <laughs> going. When are you going to let me off? Pueblo, baby. Pueblo. When are you going to let me off? Where are we going? Las Vegas, sweetheart. Las Vegas. Look, I'm sick and tired of this. Driving all day, arguing all the way. Lying, lying, lying. The way you're behaving. If you don't let me off at the very next stop, the very next town, I'll never come back. Where are we, anyhow? Albuquerque. Just across the Rio Grande and we'll be in Albuquerque. All right. Albuquerque it is. But no farther. <laughs> I never took her into Albuquerque. I never meant to. All that driving was just to get up my nerve. When we come to the Rio Grande, I said to myself, that's the place. So we crossed the bridge. I pulled off the road. She started nagging me again, and I choked her. I choked her to death. Her body? In the river. She was wearing? Blue dress, blue shoes, black pocketbook. Hat? No. No feather hat? Feather hat. Feather... Oh, yeah, yeah. The little feather hat, yeah. Uh, Lieutenant, uh, would you come over here a minute, please? What do you think? Mm, your first hunt was right. He killed her. Yeah, but he's a very smart cookie. Dumped the body in the river, he says. Don't you see? He knows there's no case without a corpse. A valise full of clothing, that's not murder evidence. You need a body. See, the Rio Grande. Albert Kirky could drag... Well, listen, that was three months ago before the spring flood. They won't find anybody. But I've got an idea. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, try it. What do we got to lose? Uh, Mr. Gray. Yes, sir, you want me to sign that confession? Uh, later, Mr. Gray. Uh, just a couple of little questions first. Uh, now, the bridge. You said you drove... Over the bridge. That's right. It is on the other side, the Albuquerque side. All right, all right. Now, we're going to check that, of course. On, and it would help if we knew where to drag your wife's body, if you could actually prove you crossed that bridge. Now, the toll taker, the man in the booth who takes your toll, is there any reason he might remember the you? The man in the booth? Uh -huh. No, I don't think he would. Well, did he say anything? For instance, like, uh, thank you, or nice evening, or... Yes, thanks, he said. Thanks, Sure. Not that I really remembered, you know, but now you mention it, of course he said thanks. Then you drove on. That's right. And off the bridge. Now, uh, left or right? Oh, let's see. We... Well, we're just trying to find out where you pushed her body in. I, I mean, above the bridge or below. Oh, yeah, well, let me see. It is... Well... There's a, a turn off to the right down the river road. And... That's right. It's right. We turned right off the bridge to, to the right. And there you choked her to death and... Pushed her into the river. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Gray. You're welcome. Any other information I can give you, I mean, now it's off my chest, I'll be glad to cooperate. Anything you want to there know... There is I'm... one thing we want, Gray. The truth. For a change, the truth. But that is the truth. I admit everything else is lies, but... Never mind the buts, Gray. There's plenty wrong with this truthful story of yours. In the first place, there is no toll on that bridge. Not since 1947. And in the second place, there's no river road turnoff anywhere near the bridge. Now, come on, Gray. Let's have the truth. All right. The truth is I... I killed her. That we know. But where's her body? It's... It's up in the hills. I... I buried her back in the hills. All the rest is lies. 
I killed her in the hills, and I buried her there. right here. Yeah, yeah, Lieutenant, right here. I'm sure it is by this creek. I mean, the creek wasn't running yet, but I buried her right here. You didn't find anything, boys? No. This ground's never been dug up. I'll lay to that. It's all rock. But I'm sure it is right about here. Right here. You were sure about the other two places, too? The creek bottom, the rock outcrop? Well, oh, it is here. I'm sure. Just that tree. I remember that tree. All right, boys, what do you say? Another wild goose chase. If we keep this up, we won't find no body. We'll find gold. Gold. The magic word rings a bell. Gold. These hills are pocked with mine working. Go. To try one last hunch, one last gambit in this crazy stalling game, this crazy killing husband is playing, leading the law all over the lot. Uh, Mr. Gray. Yes, sir? Uh, a couple of notes for my story, <laughs> if I ever get around to writing it. Uh, you're a native of these parts, huh? No, sir. I'm from Utah way. Oh, I see. Uh, Came up here as a prospector, maybe? Me? Mm. No, sir. I, I never had the gold fever, but I made my living off those who did. As a carpenter? Yes, sir, as a carpenter. I let the other fellows dig for the stuff. I built their shacks and their houses. And their shafts? And their shafts and their offices and all that. But if you want to put me down as a gold prospector, it'll make your story any better. Okay, what... Mr. Gray. Thanks. You've helped a lot. Lieutenant. What is it, Bernie? Forget the shovels. Try one of those old mine shafts. I know there are hundreds, but try them all. Do you know or is it a hundred? Both. There is a body down a mine shaft. I'll lay to that. They take off. Determined to check every mine shaft in the Ward Rollinsville area. If it takes all night. And now you, Bernard Beckwith a hold up in Rollinsville's combined telephone exchange police station, holding the wire open to your night desk, determined to keep it open until they come in with the end of your story. That is, if they come in with the story. And if you have to read the dictionary over the phone from now till doomsday. Averse, unwilling, not favorable to, turned away from the principal axis, Aversion, Bernie. dislike, an object of dislike. Aversion. Hey, 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 Bernie, Bernie, uh, Bernie, Bernie. Oh, hi. Hey, take a well, look at this. Wait all I'm left. Uh-oh. Did he identify? He didn't have to. He had been at you twice. She was wearing it, didn't he? A little feather hat with a bullet hole in it. Yeah. Hey, desk, I'll give you the lead in a second. Okay, Lieutenant, where was the body? Like you said, down a mine shaft. The old dewdrop mine. Hey, that's my phone. You can't take it. I've been holding that line to tell them that... Hey, hey, quiet a second. Hello. Hello, desk. Look, this is Detective Higgins of the Denver Police. Here's another angle for your story. Put this in. Your man Beckwith aid was so invaluable to this investigation... Oh, listen, let me get my story Without him, in. the investigation might have bogged down. What? Well, yes, you certainly can quote me. Now we read you that telegram from Bernard Beckwith of the Denver, Colorado Post. Killer in tonight's big story finally signed 17-page statement of true story of wife's murder. He pleaded guilty, waived jury trial, and was sentenced to 50 years to life from which there is no appeal. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the newspaper reporter.
The Big Story has been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.